So I want to uh, share with you a project that my group has been working on. So we would like to predict structures of cyclic peptides. And our end goal is we hope that if somebody gives us a cyclic peptide sequence, for example, cyclo AVVRR, so lowercase letters denote D amino acid, then we want to be able to quickly provide them what the structural ensemble looks like. For example, 55.4% will adopt this structure, 5.5 will adopt this structure, and so on and so forth. Why are we interested in cyclic peptides? Here is a diagram that shows the currently available uh, categories of uh, drugs. So on the bottom left, we have small molecules, and RO5 means rule of five. Small molecules drugs, so we can think about uh, ibuprofen or Tylenol that you can actually just take by mouth. So we say that they have very good pharmacokinetic properties. And the rule of five means that because, you know, like Pfizer, Merck, or the drug companies have developed a lot of effort into developing small molecules. So they figure out a set of rules that can make small molecule drugs uh, overly bioavailable. Typically, the molecular weight is going to be smaller than 500 Dalton. And so you see all these small organic molecules. Things the size is small, they are very good at some things, but not so good at other things. For example, they are very good at targeting an enzyme binding pocket. So a small organic molecule will fit into a little enzyme binding pocket. However, today, if you want to target, for example, a protein surface or a protein protein interaction, then it's like you're sending in a piece of chocolate trying to break two people apart. So the little piece of chocolate does not have enough surface area to intervene with a protein protein interaction. So um, in these cases, you will actually look into a different category of drug called biologics. So these are antibodies and other proteins. So they are the really big proteins, like really big entity. Then they can actually have high affinity and selectivity for proteins or for protein protein interactions. But we do know that uh, for cancer patients, for example, you see them sitting in a lounge, right? They have to do the IV drip. They couldn't actually just pop the drug in their mouth, which is like very inconvenient for patients. And these, it, this is because these proteins are so huge and then they are protein in nature. So when you actually take them by mouth, they get chewed down by enzymes, get, they get treated as food. And then they also often do not cross uh, the cell membrane. So you couldn't use them to target intracellular uh, targets. In the middle, then, is where cyclic peptides sit. So people found out that, hey, there are these microcycles and natural products that, you know, we found in nature made by, for example, fungi and uh, bacteria. So these cyclic peptides, uh, some of them can actually target large protein surfaces, and they also can be mem uh, membrane permeable and orally bioavailable at the same time. So perhaps this is a category of molecules that has the best contribute attributes of the two worlds. So this is a very optimistic thinking, right? So if you are a pessimist like me and you'd be like, wait a second, how about if I combine the worst attributes of the two worlds? So it turns out that it's actually very difficult to realize this idea. And currently there are only 50 uh, cyclic peptide drugs on the market and most of them are actually natural products or derivatives. So it remains very difficult for scientists to de novo design a cyclic peptide that can target specific proteins that you want and also be membrane permeable and overly bioavailable. So I want to discuss why it is currently very challenging to develop cyclic peptides and also what are some of the current challenges in modeling cyclic peptides. I'm going to use an example of protein protein interactions. So in each of uh, these pictures, uh, blue is a huge protein, red is another huge protein that come into contact, trigger conformational changes, and the signal gets processed. Protein-protein uh, interactions are very prevalent in biology, and a lot of them are upregulated in pathology. So people are very interested in breaking specific protein-protein interactions that's overly populated in a disease. If we have structural information, it makes the design of an inhibitor easier. So if we take a look at all the protein-protein interactions in the protein data bank, we actually see that 50% of the interface residues form non-regular non secondary structures. What does that mean? So if I zoom in here, it looks like the blue protein is forming some kind of loop-like structure and glued to the target uh, uh, gray surface. So these are what people call hot loop. So there are loop-like structures they contribute a lot to the binding affinity, and that's why they are called hot. So if today you want me to design something that will rule to the gray surface, then I have a handle, right? So I said, oh, okay, that blue protein glues to the gray surface, 
And what's the most important motif is this S E S E. These four residues orient in those ways that confer a lot of the binding affinity. Therefore, if you want me to design something that will go to the grave, I'm going to mimic what the blue does, right? So I'm going to synthesize a peptide that has serine glutamate, serine glutamate. And I can add a couple amino acids represented by this magical red dash line. And I can do a head to tail cyclization. This becomes a sickly peptide. So it's a circle. So the most important thing is I want part of this circle, this green portion, to look exactly like that. Right. So the challenge is how do I design the linker to actually best stabilize the desired loop structure? Then this problem will be solved if I actually know how sequence controls the structure of a cyclic peptide. So for example, I can design linker sequence number one. This is what the resulting cyclic peptide looks like. Then you can see, oh, the SESE, wow, they point in the, exactly the direction that I want you to point to. So this supposedly will be a good binder. You can design a different cyclic peptide with a different linker, then now you still have SESD residues, but now they're pointing in some random directions that you don't want. So then this uh, will not be a very good binder. Why is it very difficult for us to rationally design cyclic peptides? I think one of the reasons is that it's actually very difficult for us to understand how sequence controls cyclic peptides, because unlike the peptide that I show in the introduction talk, Cyclic peptides typically are small. So they typically range from five to like 15 residues. So they don't actually usually form alpha helix or beta she, right? So in solution, they tend to adopt multiple conformation, which means that in solution, they don't have one dominant conformation. Some percentage will form this conformation A, some percentage will do B, some conformation will do C. This means that even if I'm willing to do solution AMR spectroscopy, what I'm going to see is a mess. So I don't know what the heck is going on in my solution. So I don't know how to report to you what the structures look like by experiment. Since we mentioned molecular dynamic simulation, you probably had the idea, hey, you mentioned that you can run the simulation. So why don't you just run the simulation, right? So for the sequence number one, you just watch it for a day, right? And you can actually tell me how many percentage will form what structure and so on and so forth. Then I can look at this structure ensemble and decide Oh, only 2% of the structure ensemble pointing point the SES residues in the direction that I want. If I change a sequence, then you can run your simulation again for this new sequence. And then, oh, this time 45% of the simulation frames have the SESE pointing in the direction that I want. So sequence two should be better than sequence one. Why don't we do that on a large scale? So I want to first mention some challenges in modeling cyclic peptides. So first, uh, they have been groups, for example, the Baker lab and also our lab. We are trying to design well-structured cyclic peptides, for example, using proline. And then uh, for us, we also develop some well-structured cyclic peptide without proline. So then the goal here is to actually, for example, verify our simulation predictions, like we said before, right? So if today I can tell you that I predict this cyclic peptide to be well-structured, then someone can synthesize this peptide and do solution AMR. This time, we predict you're not going to see a mess. You're going to see very clean signals. Then you can tell me that if the NOEs that you see match the structure that I predicted. However, most of the cyclic peptide sequences are not going to be good players like this. They're going to be a mess. So what we want to do is we want to report the whole structure ensembles for cyclic peptides, be them well-structured or not. The second thing I want to mention is when we look at the uh, a big protein, they tend to form alpha helix and beta she, which means they bury the AMI uh, CLNH group within their backbone. However, for cyclic peptides, they tend to be so tiny, right? And then they couldn't actually satisfy all the intramolecular hydrogen bonds. So you can see a lot of silver exposed CLNH group. And in some extreme case, you can even see cage water molecules within the cyclic peptide. This means that for me to actually accurately describe the energetics of different conformation, I need to use explicit solving in, uh, simulation. The implication is that, well, for a computational chemist, if you say you don't care about water, then my simulation will look like the right. So I will only have the peptide, which is about 110 atoms. I will have what we call implicit solvent, which means that I know I'm supposed to have water, but water is just a dielectric. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna weaken your Coulomb interaction. So today, if you have a Coulomb interaction between two charges, I'm gonna scale it down by 80. 
because I know I'm supposed to have water in my simulation. And this is a very cheap simulation, right? Because your total number of atoms is still 110. However, today, if you think it's very important that for chemists, you describe water as HOH. Now I have to fill my whole box with water molecules. Now all of a sudden, the number of atoms goes from 110 on the right to 3,000 on the left. Now this means that this simulation is gonna run pretty, pretty slowly. So uh, the third challenge is that secret peptides, they're head to tail cyclized small peptide. And then here is a simulation of a secret peptide just minding its own business. And you probably have a feeling this is not as exciting as the movie I showed before. It's not doing anything fun. So if today I plot in the simulation, as a function of time as I run the simulation, what is the change of your phi and psi dihedral for each of the eight amino acids? And you can see for the first five amino acids, it looks like it's plateauing. It's not changing at all. So it's just like, oh, uh, I did not move. All right. So what does this mean? This either means I'm so lucky that I guess the native structure, the most stable structure, or I'm stuck in the local minima. So as a pessimist, I think I'm stuck in a local minima. <laughs> Because I can start with a different initial structure. I, I see that it gets stuck again, but in a different location, right? So is either of the answer correct? Probably not, right? So I'm actually having a problem that is in my simulation, great idea, but I need to use ex explicit solvent simulation, which is very expensive. I also have poor conformational sampling, which means it's very difficult for me to get converged results. So in the interest of time, I'm going to share with you how we overcome this sampling problem and then tell you how we actually uh, are able to use molecular dynamic simulation in an efficient way by combining the results with uh, machine learning model. So the first problem is that, well, in your simulation, you told me it's so awesome, but then what if you get stuck? So assuming that here is a simplified underlying free energy profile. You start with your you start your simulation at 60. At this temperature, it's gonna take a very long time for me to cross this barrier. Then what's gonna happen is as you run the simulation, you saw that, hey, I never move away from 60, right? So then what you can do is you can run this simulation to the end of the time. It will eventually overcome the barrier, but you don't have the patience, right? You want to get the results quickly. So what you can do is you can do what we call an enhanced sampling simulation. So for example, in this technique called meta dynamic simulation, I'm actually going to mess with my system during the simulation. What we're gonna do is we're gonna push the system away from local free energy minimum by depositing repulsive potential along a specific coordinate. I'm going to try to translate that into English. So what you're doing is you're playing a game with your simulation. So you start with a simulation at 60, right? And it's gonna get stuck. So you take your notebook and say, oh, you like 60, okay? I'm going to make you hate 60. So you intentionally deposit repulsive potential and you report that I'm going to make you hate 60 by that much. Your peptide will say, I uh, still kind of like 60 ish. Now I like 75. And then you say, okay, like 75, make you hate 75. So you play this game so many times that your peptide will finally be like, fine, don't like 60 anymore. So let's go to minus 90. So you repeat this process until your peptide now traverse minus 100 and 180 evenly. So you modify the dynamics of your system. But then what you care about is, hey, I want you to tell me without you messing with me, what's the most stable. Then you take your notebook, you say, oh, I'm gonna sum up all my record. You have a very intriguing shape, right? So then this means that at this location, I need to make you hate it a lot. So you will be able to, you will be willing to leave it. And this is another uh, minimum. I need to make you hate it, but not so much. So if I inverse this profile, that I can recover the original free energy profile. So then this is a method that we uh, use uh, to uh, run simulation efficiently for cyclic peptide. Now we can obtain a converged structure ensemble in 100 nanoseconds. So you probably are thinking like, what is 100 nanoseconds in real human life? So I can probably tell you that for a decent compute node, that will take about one day to run. Right. So then depending on how many nodes that you have, then you, you get to control how many simulations you can complete in, for example, a week. 
So my kind, for my kind of computational power, that we can probably run something like 50 sequences in a week. So you can say, hey, I can stimulate sickly peptide, but you go to any biotech or pharma company or even any experimental collaborators, they were like, uh, 50 a week? <laughs> We want you to do 10,000 in a day, okay? So I want you to make predictions of 10,000 in a day. I don't have time to wait for your 50 sequences a week, right? So this is like efficient simulation of sickly peptides. So it's very rare for a, a, a pharma company to actually use simulation as a predictive tool. So they usually use it to explain something that's very intriguing. They couldn't figure out what's going on in experiment. So this is not feasible for large-scale screening. So how can we actually replace the need of running these time-consuming simulation with a machine learning model. So the idea is I'm going to buy the bullet one, right? So I'm going to run simulation for, for example, 700 training sequences. Then I'm going to get a result. Then I'm going to train a machine learning model to recapitulate those results. Therefore, when you actually give me a new sequence, I no longer need to spend one day or two days running a simulation anymore. So what we come up with is this machine learning platform. So uh, I want to discuss in the rest of my time how we represent sickly peptide structure ensemble. As Eva was saying, how do you actually turn these into a numerical representation that a computer can understand? And then how we formulate this problem and how we design a training data set. To describe a sickly peptide structure, then what we think is the most important is the backbone confirmation. So we look at, uh, uh, for example, sickly pentapeptide in this case. We simulate a sickly pentapeptide made of O-glycine, which is the smallest amino acid, supposedly the most flexible. Then we can actually see that in the Raman changer plot, when we plot the distribution of the backbone phi and side, there are specific hot spots, right? So those are the, the, the phi and side angles of sickly pentapeptide light. So we actually dissect this two-dimensional map into 10 different regions. Today, if you give me a sequence, ABVRR, I run the simulation. The top structure, it looks like this. Then I can say that, hey, your first amino acid, the phi inside angle is over here. I will look into my map. Oh, that's the pink lambda area. The second amino acid, oh, it adopts this phi inside angle, and that's the bottom right beta area. So each amino acid, based on the phi inside angle in the structure, it gets a structural digit. So then I will tell the computer, the top structure for this sequence is lambda beta pi lambda zeta, population 58.6. The second one is this, third, third one is that, and so on and so forth. So this is how we encode the structure information. How do we actually formulate this problem? So we are trying, we are, sorry, currently we are building a very interpretable model. Ooh, where was I? So uh, let me see, du, 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 uh, uh, probably here. Okay, we're well, trying to build a very interpretable model. So we are trying to predict the population of a specific sequence, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, adopting structural digit S1, S2, S3, S5. In the uh, chemist's mind, this, this has something to do with the energy for this confirmation. So here is the population of a confirmation I. The energy of that confirmation I is here, and then divided by KT, this is a Boltzmann factor for that confirmation. Q is a partition function that everybody hates in physical chemistry. It's a sum of all confirmations Boltzmann factor. This makes sure that when you sum up all possible confirmations populations, it equals 100%. So in this first model, we consider one, two, and one, three interactions. For example, how what will change the preference of a specific structure? Then it probably matters if the first two amino acids are GG or GA or AA. So there are five such one, two neighboring interactions in a pentapeptide. There are also five such one, three interactions in a sickly pentapeptide. For example, it's G something G, G something A, A something G, and so on and so forth. So in our machine learning model, we have the, all those weights, the 10 weights. Then in our training data set, we are actually collecting a lot of population for different sequences adopting different structures. So we know the answer. Then what we are trying to do is we are trying to optimize all these weights. So for a specific population, then I will pick up the five weights I need for the one, two, five weights I need for the one, three, and the partition function. So what we are trying to do is to adjust all these weights so that the fitted population doesn't deviate from the observed population. 
how we build our training sequences is we want to observe as many different patterns as possible. So we build a small random sequence set that we enable us to observe all the X1, X2, X3 population. First, we want to see, hey, does this model recapitulate the training data set? So we call this a string model, which stands for structural ensemble achieved by molecular dynamics and machine learning. So in each of these dots is a specific sequence adapting a specific structure. What we want is the Y equals to X. So the Y is the observed population of that structure for that sequence. X is the fitted population. So we actually did pretty well. The weighted error is about 0.5. Now, if you give me a new sequence, I don't need to run a simulation anymore. So for example, you say cycle SBFAA. Within one second, this machine learning model will say top structure is this, population 19.8. Second mostly popular structure is this, population 50.8, so on and so forth. If you spend one day to run the simulation, you are going to get 19.2, 15.3, and 8.5. This means that we, when we test on 50 new random sequences, we have an average error of 1.5%. So if you're willing to stomach a 1.5% error, then our suggestion is don't run simulations anymore. We build a bullet for you, we build a model, then we're gonna be able to tell you what your simulation results are supposed to be in less than one second for each sequence. So with this, we uh, can now achieve very uh, efficient predictions of sickly peptides. In the interest of time, I'm just going to jump to the very end and say that we are also very interested in predicting properties of sickly peptides, right? So in a uh, chemist's mind, sequence control the structure, structure control the property. So uh, we are currently working uh, with uh, experimental collaborators. So we probably have, you know, a lot of data for different sequences, right? So some of you probably already measure, for example, binding affinity of different sequences, member permeability of different sequences. What we're trying to figure out is how do you best use the current data to make predictions for the next generation design that you should test on, right? So which sequences will have the best binding affinity and the best member permeability at the same time? So our thought is if you directly go from sequences to binding affinity, it's going to be a pretty high bar for the machine learning model to figure out what's going on. So what we're currently doing is we're going to supplement a model, we're gonna tell the model, sequence number one will adopt these structures with these population, binding affinity 3.291. Sequence two will adopt these structures, oh, different population, now binding affinity 2.875. Can you please figure out why the binding affinity goes like that? So we are uh, collaborating with uh, Scott Loki at the UC Santa Cruz, for example, to understand how sickly peptide sequence control the structure and in turn control, for example, the member permeability. So I'm gonna end my talk here. So hopefully I share with you uh, some of uh, uh, recent developments in trying to understand and design sickly peptides. And hopefully one day we'll be able to have rapid and accurate structure and property predictions that enable us to discover uh, helpful sickly peptides for therapeutics. So thank you so much. And I'd like to thank my group members and especially uh, Dr. Miao uh, and, oh, I, sorry, I swapped this. So Mark and then Tiffany. And uh, I'd like to thank the funding agency and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.